you, you came to the United States, mm -hmm. you know, they, they sent they sent you off, you know, Allah Akbar, you know, you've got to go to jihad. Mm -hmm. And you, you left with, with Martian orders. What's that? You know what that is? No. Hamid's case shows that false confessions don't just happen in rural, underfunded police departments. They can happen at the very top. They can happen at the FBI. And they can happen in cases involving international terrorism. I was hoping for a normal life before all this happened. I just got married at the time, and I was just hoping to move on with my life and all this happened. Ahmed Hayat's story takes place in the months and years following the horrific 9-11 attacks. There was a lot of fear in this country that there would be future attacks. And there was a lot of really important law enforcement work done to keep us all safe. But sometimes the law enforcement work that was done became driven by fear too much. The story of Hamid's wrongful conviction actually starts a few hours north of Lodi, California, in a little ski village in Oregon. That's where a man named Nassim Khan lived. He was 28 years old, a convenience store employee. They recruited Nassim Khan to become an informant, somebody who they hoped would infiltrate Muslim American communities in the United States and provide them with any information about so-called sleeper cells. And pretty soon, Nassim Khan went from being a convenience store employee who made $7 an hour to being an FBI informant on the federal government payroll. He made hundreds of thousands of dollars. The Hyatt family had no connection whatsoever to terrorist activities or politics of any kind. Nassim began reaching out to Hamid, inviting him to become friends with him. Now, Nassim was more than 10 years older than Hamid when this happened. And for his part, Hamid couldn't believe his luck. Here was this cool guy, older, with apparently endless money and a fancy car, who wanted to be friends with Hamid. Hamid was all in. But every tip Nassim brought to the FBI didn't pan out. Over and over and over again, his tips turned out to be worthless. Turns out Nassim Khan had a reputation for lying. His own mother later called him a bag full of lies, air, and deceit. So there was a lot of pressure on the government to show that they'd gotten results from Nassim Khan and his information. And when Nassim began feeding them information about 19-year-old Hamid Hyatt, the government was listening. Pretty soon, skinny little Hamid started talking of big game too. He told Nassim that on a trip to Pakistan, he'd participated in a Taliban attack. When Nassim said that he, Nassim, wanted to go to a terrorist training camp, Hamid even said he thought that was cool. But every time Nassim tried to urge Hamid to take a step himself to become involved in terrorist activities or extremism of, of one kind or another, Hamid always refused over and over, even as he tried to impress this cool older friend. That's when Nassim Khan smelled a particular opportunity. Nassim kept calling him and urging him to go join a terrorist training camp. This is your moment, he told Hamid. This is your opportunity to go get trained to participate in extremist activities. But again and again, on these recorded phone calls, Hamid resists the pressure. But just a few days later, on June 3rd, 2005, the FBI was at the Hyatt family home, and they brought Hamid in for questioning. I understand you have some information that you've been providing about some things, uh, uh, important to us. Mm -hmm. 
And so I want to thank you initially for that. Oh, that's my job from the country, you know. I appreciate that. We see skinny little Hamid in a chair pushed up against the wall in front of a cluttered desk. He's faced with two big FBI agents. Now, as soon as the cameras are turned on, these agents accuse Hamid. They say, we know you went to a terrorist training camp while you were in Pakistan for between three and six months. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's what everybody says who goes to camp. It's almost like what you're supposed to say. So I didn't know what, what I was getting into. That's, uh, I mean, it's, it's common and it's not true. Everybody knows. That that's the only thing I can tell you guys. I got many second time like that. And you know. Hamid immediately denies this, but the agents start using lies to break down Hamid's resistance. They tell him that he'd failed a polygraph that he apparently had taken earlier in the day. They tell him that they have satellite imagery of a camp in Pakistan, and they imply that that imagery shows Hamid at the camp. And Hamid looks completely at sea. He's obviously terrified. He tells the officers over and over again, I'll say anything for my country. Now, the agents ask him to describe this terrorist training camp. At first, he tells them that he went to this training camp in the middle of the cold season, but then he changes it to the warm season. He tells them that it was in rural Afghanistan, but when the agents won't accept that, he switches it to rural Pakistan. The story doesn't make any sense, and eventually the officers, after this goes on for hours, start feeding Hamid the information that they want him to describe. They train me like for guns and like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. And you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, some of them are automatic, and you know, some of them are not automatic like that. If some are automatic, some are not automatic. Yeah. You, you shot targets. Yeah. What do the targets look like? Do they, like, you know, those turn those things in there? What they call that? You know, like uh, you know, I don't know what the name they call that. What's it? What's a what's it called? A circle thing? A bullseye? I mean, like a bullseye. Yeah. I don't know the name, sorry, but mm -hmm. you told me earlier about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that. That's fine. Okay. okay. All right. Um, all right. Yeah. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let this go for a little while here. It's getting pretty clear that these agents are frustrated because Hamid's story doesn't make any sense. So what do they do? They need corroboration. These agents bring in Hamid's father, Umar Hayat. That's where things really go off the rails. Umar describes it as being in a vast underground basement filled with 1,000 terrorists who are practicing pole vaulting while being dressed up like Ninja Turtles. Later on, Umar would say he got this whole story from the movie, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The agents keep questioning him and they keep questioning Hamid. The stories don't improve over time, but by the end of the night, they have what they need. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be here tonight, staying here in that building. You're going to go to jail. Yeah. Maybe worst of all, the government put on a piece of evidence indicating that they'd found on Hamid's person a tawiz, a travel prayer, something you carry with you, like a talisman for safety, as though it were evidence of jihadi activity. Hamid's attorney didn't challenge that, didn't explain that it was an ordinary travel prayer carried by thousands of people. At times, it, it, it did get best of me, but then I kept on telling myself, just, hey, be patient, things are gonna work out. Mm -hmm. 
one by one, these alibi witnesses are testifying by live video feed from Pakistan to tell the court that Hamid Hyatt was completely innocent. He didn't go anywhere for a weekend, let alone three months. In addition, Dennis brought forward false confession experts, people who played the video of Hamid's confession and showed how everything he said was fed to him by federal agents. And Dennis also brought forward an expert in Islamic studies who pointed out that that travel prayer was a perfectly ordinary religious document. With all of this new information, the case took a sharp turn. In August 2019, the court threw out Hamid's conviction and after 14 years in prison, he walked a free man. I can still remember Dennis, my attorney, telling me, hey, we won, and I'm like, stop playing with me, stop joking with me. It was just, I, um, I, just, I still think it's a dream. I just prostrated, honestly. I think uh, a lot, just prostrated, like, thank you for this day. I, I guess, sorry, getting emotional. So that was the first time I met my mom and dad, and it was, uh, yeah, the only person, like I said, was my uh, sister, I told her, and my younger brother. No, I just tell my mom not to cry. You know what I mean? Not to cry. I said, your prayer's been, uh, your prayer's been answered. I'm here. It's truly a blessing to have a community with uh, really supporting me. And when I came out, the love and support they showed me. I started recently working. Plus, I just trying to reconnect with family members, uh, young nieces and nephews that were born after me. So I spend time with them. I look at it as an opportunity. Work on myself now. Uh, be better than what I was when I went in, and uh, I do positive. You know. If I can make a difference uh, and, you know, help out other people who are incarcerated in a similar situation of mine or in wrongful convictions or whatever, and that's my goal. I actually just educate the public about everybody. It shows that we need to reform the way interrogation happens across the board, from the FBI down to the smallest local agencies. There are good people working on changing the way interrogation works so that we can identify real perpetrators with accuracy while making sure innocents like Hamid don't have to endure years of wrongful incarceration. It don't matter how long it takes, you know, just continue fighting for freedom. I, the system is now, uh, uh, you know, not that, uh, what's that called, uh, uh, easy to get justice, actually, but you got to fight for it. You know what I mean? So, like, what, it took me, what, 14 years to get justice? So, 